Welcome everybody to the Liturgy of the Chalice. Today we're going to get we're going to continue our discussion about the Gospel of Philip. This is part nine of a series that is going on for some time now. You can listen to earlier recordings on YouTube or Facebook to get caught up if this is your first time. And we'll be continuing our discussion for some time. The Gospel of Philip is lengthy and it's a very beautiful scripture. It details the understanding of the Valentinian Gnosis. The Gospel of Philip is thought to have been from the school of Valentinus, who taught a particular Gnosis, a particular school of Christianity that was budding in earlier times. The Gospel of Philip is from the Valentinian Gnosis, but also it has a lot of inspiration from the Thomasian Gnosis. That would be the Gospel of Thomas and other documents attributed to Thomas or the School of Thomas. The School of Thomas would be the disciples of Thomas that he taught and shared his understanding of Jesus' teachings with. So let's continue with our verses for the day. <clears throat> Fall and return to fullness. Before Christ came from a realm, before Christ, pardon me, before Christ, some came from a realm they could not re-enter. And they went to a place they could not yet leave. Then Christ came. Those who went in, he brought out. And those who went out, he brought in. So to understand these verses of the Gospel of Philip, we have to understand, we have to understand Valentinian Gnosis, or the, the aspect of Christian Gnosticism that budded from the bishop Valentinus. <clears throat> Valentinus said that he was a student of Thutis, and that Thutis was a disciple of Paul. Paul is in the epistles of Paul. So he is claiming that this is the secret teaching of Paul. That's what Valentinus claimed historically. So what does this mean? This might seem quite uh, strange at first read to many people that aren't familiar with uh, Gnosticism or Christian Gnosticism specifically because there are many forms of Gnosticism. Gnosis means wisdom. A Gnostic is one who has received divine wisdom or divine wisdom has been revealed within their consciousness due to sacramental work and spiritual practices they may have been advised to do. And Christian Gnosticism is very specific because Gnosticism was around a long time. There was Greek Gnosis, there was Jewish Gnosis, and the Jewish Gnosis uh, preceded Christian Gnosis or forms of Christian Gnosis. So here, what does all this mean? Before Christ, some came from a realm they could not re-enter. So here, it's the Gnosis states that there are souls that are born in higher realms of the Pleroma. Pleroma are the many mansions of God, so to speak. And they left these higher realms and their souls got caught in a lower realm or lower realms which would include this earth reality that we perceive through our senses and our consciousness, our waking consciousness. So somehow our souls came from a higher realm and they got trapped or imprisoned in this lower realm. In this inherent in this lower realm is suffering, right? So there's this idea that if we don't transcend, if we don't understand or receive gnosis, illumination, 
then we have to keep on reincarnating in these lower realms of suffering until we do. Until we can somehow go back to where we may have come from. And there are many forms of gnosis too. This isn't universal for all forms of Christian gnosis. There are many different ideas that had been budding back in the ancient days of the church. <clears throat> this is just one aspect. So how did they become caught in this earth realm of suffering? The Valentinian Gnosis had a particular scheme. They believed that the God of the Hebrew Bible was an evil God, and they called it the Demiurge. And this evil God created different types of creations, including different kinds of humans. And this Demiurge is responsible in part or whole for trapping humans in its creation, the earth, so that humans can offer endless worship to it as they suffer and reincarnate. This is the mythology of the Valentinian Gnosis. Then Christ came. Where did Christ come from? They're talking about Jesus. Christ came from the invisible, unknown Father. This being, this being that was the true God that lives beyond all of creation. And somehow this, uh, this invisible, unknown Father has great compassion on humans and wanted to free it from the Demiurge. So he sent Christ. In, in the Valentinian Gnosis and in most forms of Gnosticism, if not all, Christ was seen as a divine revealer. It wasn't his death and resurrection that was thought to be salvatory. What saves the soul? What was thought to be salvatory was that uh, Jesus was a revealer of divine truth. So Jesus came as a divine realer, revealer to show people or to lead people to Gnosis, which would help them to transcend the demiurge and the world so that they could then go to the unknown Father, the true God, which is the Father of Jesus for the Christian Gnostics. Those who went in to the world of the Demiurge, trapped in the world of the Demiurge, he, Jesus, brought out. And those who went out, he brought in. Those who went out from higher realms and got caught in these lower realms, Jesus brought them back into the higher realms of the true God, the Unknown Father. That's the mythology. Historically, Jesus never talked about a demiurge. So, from my perspective, we could all believe what we want. Uh, this is meant to inspire thought, not to create creedal beliefs. But I've done some reading, and some of the best Gnostic bishops have suggested that the demiurge is representative of the human ego. The human ego, our own ego, always wants to be worshipped. It always wants comfort. It always wants its desires to be fulfilled. It always runs away from things that make it upset. Right? So for me, uh, the demiurge is my own ego. And it's what keeps me trapped in a world of suffering. There's only one supreme God. And all the spiritual realities or beings are emanations of God, including humanity. Again, the probable historical teachings of Jesus, Jesus never spoke of the Hebrew God as some evil God, or as the Demiurge, as many people interpret it. The Hebrew God was Jesus's God, that he lovingly called Abba. And Abba means father, mother, an elder, a beloved elder, a beloved parent. Ab is father, and Ba, in pre-Kabbalistic thought, 
was referring, it was, it's a female uh, suffix, a feminine suffix, which indicates the femininity of Godhead. So God is both male and female when you call it by the name Abba, like Jesus called God. And then Abba became condensed and restricted into pater, which means father only. So, the true teachings of Jesus that we see historically show a bright future. Jesus came for the evolution of humanity to make a more joyful, compassionate, helpful humanity that would help to evolve not only itself, but all the world. So this world is only a place of suffering for as long as our ego exists. But once the ego, the demiurge, is transcended, then we come into a state of heavenly consciousness. We experience the kima, or the resurrection. We become rebirthed, or regenerated. We all start off in the first Adam, of the Old Testament, which we see made many mistakes, was very misguided, uh, caused a lot of problems for themselves and others. <laughs> and the second Adam is this regenerated humanity, one who lives for spirituality, who lives for selflessness, who lives for compassion, for pure love, expansive pure consciousness. And that's what the second Adam is. And that second Adam is an anointed humanity. It is a collective Messiah expected in some schools of Judaism. And that is the Son of Man Messiah. The Son of Mankind collective Messiah, which is the communion of saints that those in this church tend to aspire to to illuminate their mind, perfect themselves, receive gnosis, that they may transcend lower realities, share in the sovereignty of God and begin to help or serve on higher levels of creation for the evolution of humanity and the earth. When Eve was in Adam, Here's the next verses from the Gospel of Philip. When Eve was in Adam, there was no death. When she was separated from him, death came. If she enters into him again, and he embraces her, death will cease to be. Original humanity was androgynous, and that's our ultimate goal, too. When we experience the kima, or the resurrection, we also become androgynous. The Sadducees were a sect of Jews that ran the second temple, and they did not believe in resurrection. Pharisees, whom Jesus often criticized in the Bible, in the Christian Testament, <clears throat> They did believe in resurrection. And Jesus believed in resurrection also, so he was a Pharisee. At one point in the Christian Testament, the Sadducees give Jesus an analysis, and he says that a woman marries so many men, so whose wife will she be in the kima, in the resurrection? And Jesus says, you apparently don't understand anything because nobody is given in marriage, in the kima, in the resurrection. For all are like the angels. And that's because angels are androgynous. Although angels are often depicted in masculine bodies in artwork, angels are androgynous. They are neither male nor female. Likewise, original humanity before the so-called fall was androgynous. When humans fell, meaning they deprioritized God and spiritual union, 
they became bifurcated. Instead of becoming androgynous, humanity became separated into masculine and feminine polarities, masculine and feminine energies. So when Eve was in Adam, when humanity was androgynous, there was no death. There was always conscious spiritual immortality. It was only when the human separated its energies, male and female separated, within separated from without, above separated from below, that's when humans were given skins, right? When it says in Genesis that they were given skins, it means they received a physical body. So the original humans had a spiritual body. And whenever the human fell, whenever humanity fell, we received physical bodies. And that physical body dies. Spiritual bodies, which we strive to attain in the Kima, after transition from this body to the beyond, that body is immortal. It's called the Neshima, which is the soul. The Neshima and higher aspects of soul are immortal. If she, Eve, enters into him again and he embraces her, death will cease to be. If our feminine energy enters and marries the masculine energy again and they become one in a spiritual embrace, death will cease to be. It's not that our physical bodies won't die, but we'll attain higher spiritual consciousness, illumination, gnosis. And that is called soul realization or soul actualization. It's to become a sadiq, a perfected saint. And that being, even if he or she lives in a body for the rest of his earthly life or her earthly life, they always live from their soul consciousness, from their union. So Eve refers to a feminine energy, and Adam refers to a masculine energy. And these two energies, for as long as they're separated or out of balance within a soul, that soul can't experience full gnosis. It cannot become perfected until the masculine and feminine polarities are joined in an embrace, become one. Become one. The wedding chamber. This verse I thought of passing up because we don't do every verse. I try to go more to what relates to the probable historical teachings of Jesus. But I thought that it's good to know that many of our Christian ancestors also had wrong ideas. If our religion does not evolve, it will die. Spirituality and cultural understand, understandings and cultural norms must evolve, otherwise these old structures will cause the whole well of wisdom of Jesus' teachings to die. And this is one such non-historical teaching of Jesus. Jesus would not have believed this. And I'll share with you why. So this, this verse is called the wedding chamber. We've talked about the sacrament of the bridal chamber in many of our prior classes. And this is referring to the wedding chamber that one must enter to receive the initiation of the bridal chamber in the Valentinian Gnosis represented by the Gospel of Philip. The verses say animals do not have a wedding chamber, nor do slaves or defiled women. The wedding chamber is for free men and virgins. Huh. Seems pretty exclusive, right? This definitely isn't an inclusive statement. So it's saying animals are dumb, they can't get into the wedding chamber. 
My dog is more compassionate than the vast amount of humanity. I think God will definitely bless her when she leaves her body. It's saying here that slaves cannot enter the bridal chamber and achieve illumination. Any woman who has had sex at all, defiled women, cannot have illumination. Oh, but men that had sex, they're cool, right? Doesn't say anything about defiled men. Only women that have had sex, well, they can't get into heaven. Sorry. Try again next life. Hopefully you'll get a man's body. It's ridiculous. The wedding chamber is for free men, not slaves, and free virgins. Women that are not slaves that are virgins. They have not had sex. This is all bullcrap, by the way. <laughs> if you haven't caught my drift yet. This is spiritual arrogance. And this is prideful. Jesus brought his proclamation to everyone. Just read the Christian Testament. He brought it to the people of the land. He tried to give it to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, even though they rejected it. Some rejected it, not all. Uh, he brought it to women. Uh, Proto-Rabbinic Rav's masters of the Jewish tradition would not accept women, and neither did, neither did the later rabbis when the rabbinical schools formed after the destruction of the Second Temple in 70 AD. They would not accept women. Jesus accepted women, and he didn't ask in the Christian Testament, did you have sex or not? Including the Samaritan woman, whom he accepted as a disciple, she had several husbands, right? Jesus didn't turn her away. The whole concept of people that are diseased, like the lepers that Jesus cured, or the blind man that he cured, the idea of sin was that, the idea of sickness was that if you sinned, the more you sinned, the more you would become susceptible to sickness and death. That's why there's the idea that uh, sin is death in the Bible, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. So Jesus would go to these sinners, these defiled men and women, prostitutes, uh, tax, uh, tax, pay, tax people that collect taxes, pardon me, tax collectors, whom were very much at odds, or there's at least friction between the Jews and the Jews who worked for the Romans to collect taxes for the Roman Empire, Jesus went to everybody. It didn't matter who they were. He just wanted to teach them to love, to purify their hearts, and that was good enough for illumination. So this is not at all resonant with the teachings of Jesus. It became something for some Gnostic sects, not all Gnostic sects believe the same thing, then or now, but the idea then, the Valentinian Gnosis was very aesthetic, meaning that even people that weren't part of a priesthood, so to speak, would become uh, celibate, they wouldn't have sex. So not having sex somehow made you better than people that have had sex. And of course, it's just not true. Many married people that have children are much more spiritually elevated and evolved than monks that I have met and even lived with in the past. So whether you've whether a man and woman has come together, you've been celibate all your life, it doesn't mean anything in the sense of spiritual growth. What causes spiritual growth? Not celibacy, I can tell you that for sure. It's doing the work. It's doing the teachings. It's purifying every thought, word, and deed. It's praying, it's meditating. 
It's selflessly serving people in our communities that are suffering. That is what makes you eligible for the Messianic Marriage Banquet, which is synonymous with the Bridal Chamber. So this, I'm showing it to you just so that you know exactly what not to believe. Live your life authentically with pure love, pure consciousness, and do the teachings of Jesus, and you can merge while living consciously with the communion of saints. And then when you leave the physical frame, you could join those beings in higher spiritual realms to do higher work. So next we have the idea of baptism again. We are born again through the Holy Spirit, and we are conceived through Christ in baptism with two elements. We are anointed through the Spirit, and when we were conceived, we were united. No one can see oneself in the water or in a mirror without light, nor can you see yourself in the light without water or a mirror. So it is necessary to baptize with two elements, light and water, and light is chrism. So these verses are very deep and very powerful. Again, over and over throughout the Gospel of Philip, we see the writers talking about and advocating the spiritual efficacy of baptism with water and chrismation, which is to anoint or baptize with oil. So here, it's very interesting. You know, we're born again. Born again means to be resurrected, as we learned last week. To resurrect ourselves from lower, selfless, earthy, material-based only desires to desiring God alone and union with God alone. That is what it means to be born again. In order to be born again or to have spiritual regeneration, you need to have two elements. <clears throat> Water for baptism and light, which is said to come from the oil of chrism because it's believed that the element of fire is in the oil, and fire gives light. So in order to be born again, or to be, spiritually re to be spiritually reborn, you have to receive these two sacraments of baptism and chrism. And chrism is thought to be the higher of the sacraments, according to the Gospel of Philip. So what happens in water, even in the surface of oil, when light is shining above it, we can see the reflection of our faces. So the work of sacrament is to be able to reflect to us our own soul, to be able to understand our soul and the deeper realities of our soul and its relationship with God and its unity with God. So the goal of baptism is to bring us onto the spiritual path. Baptism is often seen as the only initiation in modern Christianity, and afterwards you're thought to be saved. In the most ancient days, Jesus did not see it that way. The historical teachings of Jesus state that <clears throat> he, he would make a proclamation, he'd go from town to town and say that the Malkuth is coming, the sovereignty of God is coming, have fidelity with, do my teachings, because this will make the Malkuth manifest within you. The first step before you can receive the Malkuth was to have the baptism of John. And what this meant is it was a, it was a purification, a mikvah, a water purification in living water, in a stream or elsewhere, 
often in cisterns. And this purification was done first before the person, the soul, would pledge that they are returning to God. They are returning to the way of God, to the law of God, to the Torah. That's what the original baptism represented. It was saying, I am going to make an effort, a sincere effort to return to God. And I'm going to do your teachings, Jesus, until I become spiritually perfected. And when one was spiritually perfected, they would be called born again. Or to receive the birth from above is exactly how the Greek translates in the Gospel of John. And when they receive that rebirth, they become perfected, illumined saints. And the Malkuth, the sovereignty of God, the rulership of God, is fully reborn in the heart of that person. And that sovereignty of God, which is inside the heart of a saint, is the inner guidance of God that teaches us how to deepen our relationship with God even further. And also, they can, these saints can receive inspirations for how to help humanity to come closer to God. But before we become a saint, we have to go through different procedures, and these sacraments represented different kinds of grace that would come from God. And when you received a sacrament, you would receive different spiritual practices to do that would help you to see the reflection of your soul poetically in the water of baptism, and in the oil, the fire, the light of chrismation. Everything is in grades, grade by grade, the grawl, so to speak, the holy grawl. And baptism and chrism were two of the grades in the Valentinian Gnosis. Let us continue with the Liturgy of the Chalice. 